This afternoon's session is the bookkeeping workshop. So I'm going to turn the microphone over to Todd Caldwell. Thanks and uh, welcome everybody. We appreciate the opportunity to come before you again and, and give you some uh, what we think is useful information. Um, usually it's Susan and I uh, presenting this part. Um, we have a couple of extra speakers today that I wanted to introduce in, in the order that they're going to, to come and that way you'll know the, the new faces that you might be hearing from. Uh, first, Linda Baker is going to go over the, um, the gateway information, the changes to gateway and, and some nuances to um, help you through that process. And then after Linda speaks, uh, Leanne Tinsley will be talking about the uh, assistance to uh, non-governmental entities. And then once Leanne's done with her part, uh, Susan and I will talk about year-end duties and some internal control things. So I'll turn it over now to Linda Baker. Give me just a second, Linda. I think we have both screens going out to the, the people. Okay, I was going to go online to got that. Okay, the yes, got we that. do. See your own. Is that okay if you can't see your next slide? That's, uh, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Okay, I'm Linda Baker with the Indiana State Board of Accounts, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, Gateway today and the two forms on Gateway that you have to complete for Board of Accounts. One's the 100R, which is the Employee Compensation Report, and the other one's the Annual Financial Report. So on the slide now, we have the link to Gateway, the uh, to the Gateway Public website, and when you go to Gateway, um, over to the right, there's a login screen that I've got a uh, link that I've got circled here. So that's how you go to log in, and this is the login screen where you're going to put in your username and password. If you don't have a username and password, you need to email our help desk at gateway at sboa.in.gov and we'll get you set up. Your um, username is going to be your email address and then you'll be assigned a password when you get set up. After you log in, you'll see on the right the Board of Accounts applications on the 100R and the Annual Financial Report are listed there. And so you're going to select whichever one you want to do. So I'm just going to go through and give you some kind of general information about them, both these forms, and highlight the um, items that are new for this year. And then I'm going to go online and we'll look at the um, reports online a little bit. So the 100R Certified Reports of Names, Addresses, and Duties, and Compensation of Public Employees per IC 5-11-13 and has some things about it here. Must be filed with the state examiner electronically via gateway and you may have your budget not approved if you don't complete your 100R on gateway and it's due January 31st. And so this is what some of the screens look like when you first log in but um, again, I'm going to try to log in and go through some of these screens, but this is the screen you first see when you um, go to the 100R. Then who to report. You're going to report all people employed by your unit for the prior year. So in this case, in January, when you do this report, you're going to report all employees that you had during 20, the calendar year 2016. Even if they only worked in the summer or were temporary or part of the year, you're going to report everybody you employed during the year and how much they were paid. So a good rule of thumb is if you issued a W-2 to that person, you're going to include them on your 100R. And if you have any questions about if they're an employee or a contractor, then you can check with um, IRS Publication 15. And then what to report, you're going to report their total compensation paid during the prior year. And again, going by your IRS rules and publications to determine what is considered compensation. 
I have a question. Mm -hmm. If they worked in 215 but were paid in 216, do we add them? I would say anybody that you paid during 2016, so yes. Yes, anybody that you paid during 2016. Um, so anyway, some compensation might be if they also have a clothing allowance or they get a car or other things besides actual in their paycheck uh, money. You may, they may have other things to add to their compensation, but you would use the IRS rules for that. This is the data entry screen where you enter their information. If you're doing a manual entry, it has their name, ad um, address, and this is the business address, not their home address. Um, and then the total compensation. Um, if you have a large unit, large staff, you probably want to do a upload the data instead of manually entering it. So there's an option to do that. And then there's some helpful hints about um, this is in Gateway in general. On most of the screens, you want to hit Tab or click in the cell to go to the next cell. If you're on a screen where there's a row, type data entry, you want to enter the whole row and then press the Enter key, and then it tells you if you have any errors. So you want to finish a row at a time, not try to do it like down the columns, enter all the names, and then the compensation. You want to go across by the rows. That way you can tell if you have any errors easier as you're entering it. I have a question. Mm -hmm. It says board members should be included. We don't pay our board members except the treasurer. With that being said, do we still add all the board members? You're only going to put any that have been paid. So if they don't get paid, then you don't include them. And then many of the cells have the word required in them. If it says required, you're going to have to fill in something on that cell or you're not going to be able to save that row. So like the compensation, for example, is required. So you need to make sure you fill in all the rows, that's, all these cells that say required. Um, again, this has a few more helpful hints you can read on here. Don't use um, double quotes or avoid using any special characters in your data entry. Sometimes that causes problems. I do want to point out in bold this last item on here. For best results, use the most recent version of Chrome or Firefox. I don't recommend to use Internet Explorer. It doesn't work well on Gateway. And in particular, Microsoft is no longer supporting Internet Explorer. They have a new browser coming out called Edge, so they're no longer going to support Internet Explorer. So I don't recommend to use that when you're doing Gateway. OK, so after you've entered all your information, you're, you do the um, Submit button to actually submit it to us. If you Even after you've entered it, if you don't do the Submit, we're not going to know that it's finished or completed. So you need to make sure you do the submit option, which is the last item on the menu. And when you do the submit, as part of that process, there's an attestation form or statement that you need to uh, print out and complete and mail into us and sign it, basically attesting that you've completed it on Gateway and that your information is the correct to the best of your knowledge. So that's the screen where there where you download the attestation form. Um, so you need to get that attestation form mailed in within five days after submitting on Gateway. So you need to get it in as soon as you can. If you, for some reason, have to have us unlock your 100R and you need to make changes and you resubmit it, you need to ma uh, mail us in a new attestation form after you resubmit. And that's what the form looks like. And then at the top of all the screens in Gateway, there's a user guide link. So anytime you have questions, you want to go up to the user guide link. And you've got links to all the user guides in there for the 100R and all the other applications. So that's a good place to go for information if you need help. Also, our Board of Accounts web page, if you haven't visited that. There's the website on the screen there, and 
we have a section on gateway and that gives you a lot of information especially if you're wanting to do the vendor upload it gives more details on that on our website and then again there's our help desk email address gateway at sboa.in.gov so anytime you have a gateway question regarding the 100R or the annual report, that's where you need to send it to. Then the annual financial report is per IC 5-11-1-4 and it also must be filed with the state examiner electronically via gateway. And again, DLGF may not approve your budget if you don't file your annual report, so you want to make sure you get it done. And then it's due 60 days after your year end, so it's due March 1st, 2017. Um, a few new things. Um, we didn't really have any new things on the 100R this year. I know you're disappointed. You probably wanted some new things to do. But on the annual report, you do have some new things to look forward to. So there you go. Um, so new for 2016 on the annual report, we have a new internal control certification. And per IC 5-11-127, if you, you're probably familiar with this, um, this requires the fiscal officer to certify that they have minimal internal control standards adopted and that their personnel has received training on, on these standards. So we're going to, via the annual report, have some questions on that. So it's going to be fairly simple. We don't have that the new annual report ready yet, so I can't really show it to you. But on the first screen where we ask a lot of different questions, we're going to have these two questions on the screen where you're saying certifying whether you have these standards adopted and that you've had the training for your personnel. So you want to be looking for those questions and you know make sure you answer them accurately. And this is what the questions are going to look like. So you're not going to have to upload any certifications or any anything like that. It's not going to be any um, thing to upload. You're just going to answer these questions to certify that you've done those options, done those uh, standards and training. Okay. Um, the other thing is we used to have a contract upload in the annual report that was um, optional or voluntary. We're now going to remove that because DLGF has a new contract upload system that they have a new law that requires them to do that. So if you've uploaded any contracts in the annual report in the past, you're not going to be doing it there anymore or taking that away. Before we go on, there's mm -hmm. a question, and I believe it has to do with the 100R. Mm -hmm. Who is the fiscal officer, bookkeeper, is it the bookkeeper, board treasurer, or director that attests? Um, the 100R and the annual report, usually it's the, the fiscal officer would be like the library treasurer, if you have a treasurer. And then um, on the screen now we have a few new receipts for 2016 that's listed here regarding um, local income tax. And you can always go to our website that has the address on there and look for the new updated receipt and fund tables and all the tables are on our website if you ever have any questions on those. And again, the same type of helpful hints that we talked about a while ago as far as how to enter the data. If something says required, make sure you fill that cell in and um, press the tab key to go to the next cell. Also, if you have are on a large screen, like the uh, federal grant screen, if you get federal grants and you're filling that screen out, there's a lot of information to the right that a lot of people don't see. So make sure if you see a scroll bar, you scroll all the way over to the right to make sure you're seeing everything. Um, 
One thing to note on here too is do not send SBOA a copy of your annual report, a hard copy, or proof of publication. That was a, the proof of publication was an old law a long time ago, and that's been done away with a long time. But people still like to send me those, so they just go in the circular file if I receive them. So don't waste your time mailing those in. And again, with the annual report at the very bottom, after you've entered everything, you're going to do the submit option. If, when, after you submit, if you have any errors or warnings, it's going to tell you what the errors are that you'll need to correct before you can submit. And then once you've uh, corrected all your errors, then you can submit. And then you have an attestation form to download with this, too, just like with the 100R. All right, they asked this question, mm -hmm. but we still have to publish in a local newspaper our annual financial report, correct? Yes, correct. We just don't need a copy of that. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's for certain libraries based yes. on the size of their budget. Um, is it a 300,000? 300,000. Yeah, 300, so, um, yes, I think in the user guide it lists the IC code on that too to review, but um, yes, if, you, if your budget's for libraries, it's only a certain size. You don't have if you're under that size you don't have to um, advertise and so again the user guides are linked at the top of the screen and those are very helpful a lot of the questions we get you could get answer if you look in the user guide so make sure to be aware of where those are and review those okay so then how do I go over to the website Is it over here? Just gonna, yeah. right there Let's see. Okay. I thought you already had the gateway, but we're going to go this way. Okay, so we're going to go look on the gateway just a few minutes and see what it looks like. Um, if you don't know the web address, the easiest way to get to it is by going to our Board of Accounts website at www.in.gov slash SBOA. And if we go to political subdivisions and then libraries, this gives you all the information about libraries, who to contact. And then on down here, there's gateway information on the annual report and the 100R. And then also the um, login to live site link is here. So you can go to the login page right from our website. And the user guides are also linked here at the top too, so you can look at those even before you log in if you want to. Okay, so we're going to look at the 100R, and we're going to look at a test unit I have in here for libraries. And the 2016 year is not available yet. That'll be available um, early to mid-December. We'll send out an email when it's available. So right now we're only going to look at 2015. And so the first screen that comes up when you would first uh, select 2016 after you log in, it's going to ask you the number of employees that you had, and you'll fill that in. And then after you click Proceed, it's going to ask if you're going to manually enter this data or do an upload file, because you'll get different options on your screen depending on which one you select. And then you have some questions here to answer about whether you provide health benefits and pensions for your employees. So after you answer all those questions and hit proceed, then you go to the main 100R main menu. Then the employee data entry screen is if you're going to manually enter your data where you would enter your data. I just have some test data entered in here. So you can see how this has all the information filled out. If we hit Add Row to add another person, and it's going to add a row at the bottom where we can fill in 
this information. It's kind of faint on my screen. I don't know how it looks on yours, but you can see it says required in some of these fields. So we could just type in, um, you know, the name. Um, the address is required, so we would type that in. And this guy's going to make a big $1. He's really high paid. Okay. He just is like Leanne, does the job for the fun of it, doesn't want the pay. Okay, so, um, so we're going to do save all work and return to main menu. So that's how we just added another person onto our um, grid there. There's output reports under this 100R output reports where you can come in and print out your employee listing. You can also download it to Excel if you want to do that. So I highly um, recommend that you at least come in here and review this to make sure your totals look correct and that you've got all your data entered correctly. And then this is where you submit when you're all finished to make sure you submit it. That's probably one of the big things we get when we send out our delinquent notices after January 31st and then people say, well, I did mine and I'll go in and look. Well, it still says not submitted. They forgot to submit it. So if you don't want to get a delinquent email from me, <laughs> then make sure you do the submit. And it should, it'll tell you after you've submitted the date and time and that you've submitted over here. So you can tell it's not submitted if it says that over here. And again, the user guides are linked here at the top of the screen. We have a user guide for the 100R and the annual report that gives you lots of information. So you want to peruse those in your when you have a question. Okay, and then quickly I'm going to look at the annual financial report for this test library also for 2015. So again, when you first log into this the first time for the new year, you have all these questions to answer. Um, whether you receive any federal grants, um, if we have debt or leases, do you have records for capital assets? A lot of different questions here. And that down at the very bottom is where, where we're going to have those two new questions on the internal control certifications. So after you answer all these questions and hit proceed, then that will... Um, set up the screen for you because for example if you didn't if you selected no you didn't have any grants then you're not going to see this grant screen so it's going to kind of customize your menu depending on what you've selected so that's the other thing that sometimes people at will call or email and say well I can't find where to enter my grants well that's because at the beginning they said they didn't have any grants so if you're not seeing a section that you think you need then go back to the questions and make sure you've answered those correctly um, so then we have the schedule of officials, mostly has your address, the office address, the tr uh, official's name and terms, some general information here. I always tell people to fill this out the best you can. And at the very bottom, you have to check that it's marked complete when you're done. I have a question mm -hmm. from the webinar. Mm -hmm. If we upload, can it be an Excel spreadsheet? I think that has to do with the, the 100 R, where you said there was. Uploads. No, the information on how to upload and the file format you need is all on our website that I where I was earlier on our website. So if you have questions on that, you can go to our website or look in the user guide or email our help desk if you don't understand it, and we'll um, help you with that. But you do have to put it in a certain file format. Okay, so then the uh, the main, what I call guts of the information is under your financial data by fund, where you list all your funds that you have. 
Um, this just has three funds as a sample in here, but you have all your funds listed in here, the beginning balances, the receipts and disbursements, and then an ending balance. So um, you enter the beginning balance here, also any investment balances you have, and then to enter the receipts and disbursements, you select the add edit links under the column there to go to the receipts for example and that gives you the receipt screen where you're going to enter specific receipts you have say for general property taxes and after you press the enter key it updates your totals And so you're going to go down through and enter all your receipts by these different categories. And then the same for the disbursements. And then when we go back to um, the financial data by fund screen, you see it updates the receipt total and your ending balance total as well. So it updates that when you enter it on the detail. So then the disbursements are the same. You just enter your disbursements in here by these categories, personal services, supplies, etc. And then um, besides the financial data by fund information, again, these other things will come up or be optional depending on how you answered the questions capital asset records, um, you shall have information to fill in for that. And again, you see all these fields are required, so you'll need to make sure you enter something in all the cells, even if you don't have anything for that cell, then you're going to enter a zero there, don't leave it blank. And then if you have any federal grants, you need to complete that screen. And this is the one I was talking about where it scrolls a lot to the right. There's a lot more information to the right. You have to scroll over to see. <coughs> so make sure you can fill that out completely if you have federal grants. Um, the debt and the leases, again, similar thing. Uh, the pensions. The pensions you only have to indicate or enter information on pensions if you have something other than these pensions listed here. For example, all your employees have are PERF. You select that. Do you have any other pension plans? No, I don't have any other pension plans. <coughs> this form is complete and you're done. If you do have other pension plans, if you say yes to that question, then you're going to get more screens to enter more information, and you should have information from your actuary about your pension plans. So if you have those other pension plans, you'll be having um, all the information you need to complete that from your actuary. Um, the last thing I'll talk about here a second is this risk assessment. We have changed the questions a little bit from last year, um, and I don't have the new questions yet. But the main thing I want you to um, note, if you're not familiar with this risk assessment, is perhaps go in and look at it or look at our user guide linked at the top. All the questions will be listed in there also. And you may want to go in there and review the questions and see what all we're going to be asking for to see what information you need to gather to answer these questions and kind of have them pre prepared ahead of time, what documents you may need to upload or um, what all the answers to the questions are going to be so that when you do come in here, you can just go through and answer them easily. Some of the questions do have a little um, I next to them. That means more information. So if you hover over that, it gives you more information about something in that question. And then there are going to be some of them where you have to upload a file. But again, some of these questions have changed or are going to change um, from last year. So I'm not going to go into too much detail about the specific questions. but. Just be aware you'll need to make sure you complete this risk assessment. 
And then the last part is the output reports page. This is where you can print all your different reports to review them, make sure your data is correct. Regarding the advertising, if you do have to advertise, there's a, the report that you can print to do your advertising is listed at the very bottom. And then um, again, lastly, just like the 100R, you don't want to forget to submit this when you're done. You can also do a review submission and see if you have any errors before you submit. So like in this case, it's telling us what all things we haven't filled out or completed yet. And so we can't submit until we've corrected all these errors. I have a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. One of them goes to, uh, if we uploaded the items last year, will we need to do them again this year? Does it carry it over? As you're talking about on the risk assessment? I'm talking about on the risk assessment. Um, I believe you'll have to upload those again, but I will check on that. But I believe you'll have to upload those again if they ask those those questions again. And then I'll have to check on that uh, risk assessment. What is the best way to upload a multiple page bank statement all at once? We don't have software to compile it into one file. Yes, that comes up sometimes, and you do need to compile it all into one file. You you know if you have a document that's five pages, you can't upload five, page one, page two, you have to combine it into one file. So if you don't have um, the equipment or the software to do that, then I recommend uh, taking it maybe to another um, local unit. The county auditors help some people with that or another bigger town or library close to you that can do that for you and assist you with it. Or um, even like Staples or Kinko's or some of those copy type places can um, help you with that also. But you will need to get it uploaded all or combine all into one file before you upload it. So that would be like into a PDF? Yes. Uh -huh. um, so then the last thing, like I said, is when you're all done, you want to make sure you do the submit. And don't forget to do that. And you'll go through the submit process. It'll tell you any errors, you'll correct those, and then when you don't have any errors and finish the submission, you'll have that attestation form that you'll need to download and, and mail in through the mail to us. And so I guess the main uh, takeaway I want you to have is, is if you do have any questions, again, review the user guide. That should answer a lot of your questions. And then also email our help desk at gateway at sboa.in.gov. And that should, um, if you email us, we'll try to answer your question as soon as we can get back with you. So do you have any other questions? Yeah. Well, I hope it's up by soon, early in December. So we'll be emailing when it's um, ready. So. Can I see it the other way? You want it the other way? Uh huh. Where I see my little notes at the bottom? Is that what they see? <coughs> yeah, they'll see it too. Uh, <coughs> it's up to you. I don't know if I can swap it back. Let's see, let's see. That, I'm okay. happy with this. Uh, shoot. <laughs> stop sharing? Or they wouldn't well, let's see not it at stop all. sharing. Let's oh, not okay. stop sharing. Um, let's go to. <coughs> I certainly don't mind them seeing that.
All right, we're back. Hello, I'm Leanne Tinsley with the State Board of Accounts. Um, my presentation today is going to fit into Linda's to some degree because I'm going to talk about a specific part of the annual financial report that you may or may not get to fill out. And it, of course, depends on the questions you uh, answer, whether that screen pops up or not. Is that correct, Linda? Yeah, she, she agrees. So I'm trying to help you understand the questions to, to determine if you need to answer yes or no and if you need to fill out more information on that screen. Um, my uh, One of the hats that I wear in the office, I deal with those non-governmental entities that governments give money to. Um, if they meet a certain threshold of disbursements compared to their total, they require an audit and that audit comes to us. Uh, furthermore, if they get any dollar amount of assistance there to file a report with us, similar in Gateway like you do, but it may or may not require an audit. So what we have found, uh, a lot of times our governmental units do not understand the assistance that they're handing out to non-governmental units. Uh, the office has in the past called this area not-for-profits. That's not necessarily true, but if I segue into calling things not-for-profits, what I'm meaning is non-governmental entities. So let's see how I can work. There we go. Subtitle. I'll move on to this next slide. Uh, this is just a way of introduction. I've been a State Board of Accounts employee since 1981. My prior experience was in the field doing cities, towns, hospitals, libraries, uh, universities. My email address is there for you to see. Ashley Palmer has accompanied me today. She's uh, been with us since 2014. She was instrumental in getting our E1 filing up and going in Gateway. It was a paper process in the past. And the E1 is what the non-governmental slash not-for-profits are filing in Gateway. And her email address is there. Chase Lennon is working with us to some degree. He's segueing over to the school area, um, but he is well familiar with the not-for-profit area and he may answer the phone at, at times and answer your questions. So his email is, address is up there. His experience has mostly been at the state side. Chase wanted everyone to know when he presented this that he actually is 27 years old, even though he looks 14. <laughs> He's just got this boyish face about him. Uh, I want everyone to know that I hired in as a child. <laughs> uh, the, this screen is just a little fun informational. These are all the counties I have either been in auditing or I've worked as an audit manager, 32 out of the 92. So we may have run across each other, and I hope it was a pleasant experience for you as it was for me. Okay. Uh -oh. oh, my. Let me just uh, press escape if you want to get rid of that menu. Thank you. Procured audits. Uh, that's the title that I hold. Um, in IC Code 51117, state examiner can designate an independent public accountant to audit some of those things that we audit. Uh, currently, uh, we have allowed certain things to go out. Oh, I've done it again. 
uh, currently, the things that have gone out to private examiners are housing authorities, military reuse authorities, and certain quasi-agencies like IMPERS. Uh, those are the audits that I deal with. Also, um, IC 51114 requires the annual financial report of these entities. That's the gateway report that we're talking about. Uh, IC 51119 defines what an entity is. Basically, it's someone getting uh, public money from a governmental unit. Uh, the threshold is a two-tier type of threshold for auditing. Uh, if they get $200,000 in um, public funds that they're spending and it's 50% or more of their total, they require an audit. Oh, I keep doing that. I stop that. I need to stop that. Uh, entities, like I said, aren't necessarily not-for-profits. They can be for-profit corporations that are getting government money. Again, they can be not-for-profits, and a lot of times you're familiar with a not-for-profit. It's um, a little league. It's 4-H club. We've got uh, people providing mental health services. We've got daycare centers. We've got a whole range of not-for-profits. And be also the boys and girls club. Yes, yes it is. Uh, in fact, my in-laws are involved in two not-for-profits. So, you know, Christmas and Thanksgiving is what does the State Board of Accounts want? Why are they sending me emails? It's, <laughs> it's just a constant. So it's not necessarily, well, would they be a 501c3? No, no. no. Okay. You can be unincorporated. You can be an association. You can be an organization. You can be a person. Okay. So, you know, it's not the form as much as what they're doing that makes them a non-governmental entity according to statute. And that's why it's so hard to pin them down. Uh, we have 2,000 plus, and they come and go. You know, the, the auditing and filing is dependent on are they getting and spending public monies. Sometimes they'll get one one year and not the next. They may go a couple years, and then they'll get some more. So for us to keep track of them, it's very hard. And that's why we're asking um, governmental entities to report to us on a more consistent basis. So we have some idea where they are, who they are, and how much they're getting. And we'll get to that, I promise. Libraries providing financial assistance to non-governmental entities are required to notify those entities annually in writing the following information. Five pieces of information. Uh, we've been presenting this a couple of weeks now. We don't have a template for you. You put these five items on letterhead, sign it, have them sign it, done, good. Nothing needs to be fancy. First of all, you need to provide them these two in Indiana codes. The code that tells them they need to be filing the E1 <coughs> and the code that provides them what triggers they have for getting an audit. Number two. We need you to tell them where their money is coming from. Is this state and or local money? Is this a federal grant that you're passing through to them? If it is a federal grant you're passing through to them, we want to know the formal name of the program and the CFDA number associated with that. You'd be surprised what kind of CFDA names and numbers we get through. People call it a common name or an older name and it doesn't correlate to what is happening in the real world today. The, also, a source of funding that's available is a fee-for-service. We have not identified a whole lot of these. A lot of times the fee-for-service is the state passing money out to things like uh, for Medicaid, Medicaid, because that's a specific amount for a specific person for a specific reason. We've not identified a lot of fee-for-service arrangements at the local level. You may have one. If you think you have one, call us and let us know. And we'll, we'll talk about it and see what we think, if we agree with you or it's something we haven't seen before. So you need to let them know what they're getting so they can report it to us appropriately. Someone asked, do we need to report charity drives? I'm thinking not, because that's not public money. What do you think, Susan? Well, we probably shouldn't have the account for records if it enters the records of the library. 
It would enter the records of the library as a, a donation or a gift. And then it, that they, then it goes the out. Yeah. 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 That's true. And for good internal control, you'd want it to come through the records. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. So you're saying really for receipt and disbursement. Is that what you mean for record keeping? Well, part of what triggers this is that it's, it's financial assistance. So financial assistance is public money that's given. Well, once, the, once money enters into the, the records of the library, which it should, um, it, it becomes a part of the, the public funds of the library, which could trigger this. Now, yeah. we probably need to do some research and see how we want to handle that. Yeah. So maybe we can come up with something and send that to you, Karen. And okay. Do something else. I mean, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, by default, anything that comes into the library into their records becomes public money. And then when you disperse public money, then it becomes this type of assistance that you're giving to someone else, technically speaking. Now, how many uh, non-governmental entities that you're giving charity to in terms of a drive like this would bump them into an audit? Probably not a lot. And you know, having them report this wouldn't cause them to have an audit situation. We certainly wouldn't want to bump somebody into an audit situation for this. But at this point in time, we're probably not going to ask you to report that type of um, pass-through charity donation until we've had some time to research it and come up with a consistent, consistent policy. Yes. We're going to have to repeat the question. <laughs> so you're you're using uh, your your friends of the library providing you money to then turn around and buy a table at a charity function. Yeah, or something like that. I guess what's financial assistance? Yes. Yes. Uh, on the it, in the walk over here, we actually had that conversation between you know libraries and their foundations. How is that going to work? Uh, we've kind of made the uh, decision at this point in time. We're going to have to look at that a little more. So we're not going to ask you to do anything differently at this time until we've had time to research that relationship. Um, as we get farther into this discussion, we'll be talking about financial assistance opposed to other types of um, monies passed back and forth between groups. So hopefully, one of the, um, as I've gotten into this area, financial assistance is something that seems easy to understand, but awfully hard to put into words. So we are running into this type of situation Pretty much with everyone we talk to, they've just got odd little things that come up, and you're just not sure how to deal with it. So, next slide. Oh, I've done it again. Well, there's another question, okay. and this is from Indianapolis Public Library. Uh, do you report in kind, such as providing office space for our foundation? No, at this time, no. That's one of those things we're going to have to think about. It depends on how, how broadly we want to expand the statute. I mean, you could view it as the library is spending public money to maintain that space that then they're giving someone. But then we also have to look at this as the statute was the intent of it to be that broad for us to call financial assistance not just cash but something else. Another good uh, theoretical conversation that Susan and Todd and I get to have. <laughs> That's a part of this job that's such fun, isn't it? 
All right. Item number three. You need to inform anybody that you're giving financial assistance to the uh, information that we may ask for documentation to support what they put on their E-1. Again, this a lot of times goes back to uh, a federal grant that they've put down that does not exist when we look at the authoritative literature in terms of is this a federal grant that truly exists. We will ask them for the documentation and, and potentially go, no, it's not called that, it's called this. So that's what we're looking at. We want um, support for their E-1. We are not going to ask for it all the time. Usually it's in cases where we can't understand what they've put down as financial assistance. Number four, the E-1 is not to be confused with the Secretary of State's business entity report. It's very similar names. A lot of corporations have to file a Secretary of State business report. It is accompanied by a $10 check. We are not charging you to file an E-1. Uh, we frequently get an envelope in the mail with a $10 check and we walk it down to the Secretary of State's office. So we are not charging for these people to file an E-1. Lastly, but least, not least, here's the email address that these non-governmental entities can use to talk to Ashley, uh, Nikki, or myself. Um, the number of people monitor this email address, and we will get them an answer timely. Um, I guess I need to back up a little bit. The E-1 filing is not done by you. The E-1 filing is done by the non-governmental. I'm just giving you an upfront of what it is. And possibly some of you are involved in these groups and may need to know this just as a bonus. But we're not asking the library to do this for them. That would be inappropriate. Okay, fee for service versus financial assistance. Again, we haven't identified a whole lot of these at the local level, if any, so this may be just an uh, interesting conversation and not necessarily anything you need to know, but here we go. Oh, fee for service usually is an amount paid for a predetermined, uh, amount paid for, let me set it over, the amount is paid is predetermined per unit of service i.e., you mow my yard, I'm going to give you $25. So it's based on something. You're not just going to give them $500 to do something with. You're giving them a specific amount of money for a specific item. Also, it's usually a claim process, and it's done after the fact. I mowed your yard seven times. Here's the claim for that. Uh, usually it's uh, by contractual agreement, and it doesn't change. If if it costs them $35 to mow your yard, you're not paying them more. You agreed to $25. Financial assistance. You've all probably seen or heard of grants. Financial assistance is uh, money that's given to you in certain time periods. You could get it in advance. You could get it after the fact. It's um, not necessarily after the fact for a specific amount of money for a specific item of work. Um, also, it can have a contract to it. Sometimes it varies. You know, they're going to pay you 90% up to a, a certain amount. So we're giving you uh, one side and the other side. And hopefully you can see the differences between fee-for-service and financial assistance. Additional characteristics of financial assistance. The amount paid provides a service to the public as a whole. It doesn't benefit just you. The service may not be easily measured. The relationship between you and the entity is more like a partnership or a joint venture rather than a vendor-vendee. And each party is heavily dependent on each other for the outcome of whatever service is being provided. Okay, now we're getting to Gateway and your part in this. You are to report the financial assistance you give to non-governmental entities and you're to report it in, um, and the non-governmental entity reports it in the E-1. They're both found in the same spot under State Board of Accounts there on the right in red. You'll see the R, uh, 100 R is first, annual financial report is second, 
conflict of interest disclosures is third, and then the E1 is fourth. So you and the entity will find these things in the same place. If you answer the appropriate question, financial assistance given to non-governmental entities is reported here under the core reporting. It's called, <coughs> excuse me, financial assistance to non-governmental entities. That's where you will put in your information. At this point in time, we're requesting this information. The items in red are the required pieces of information. We're going to want to know the entity, the entity's tax ID, their address, their main uh, county of operation, the name of their operating officer, their phone number, the description of the funding that goes back to what we talked about earlier, whether you're passing the money from the federal government or it's fee for service. <coughs> the amount of money, of course, and what type of non-governmental entity it is. In future years, the description of funding, the number seven on the previous screen, we're going to make a required item. The following types of assistance will be available on the drop-down box. When the entity gets to the E1, this is the kind of information that we're asking of them. If they filed an E1 with us previously, certain information will be pre-populated. If they need to change it, they can email us at the not for profit dot or um, SBOA dot IN dot gov address and we will change that as needed. We are also asking for their independent public accountants. Some of these entities get audits for uh, other reasons. They already have an accountant. We're also asking them to fill in the financial information. Um, it's a uh, Kind of odd, I don't know why this happened, but they have to fill in their total disbursements first on line three. Lines one and two auto fill from the um, information in section three. Section three, we're going to ask them to add as many um, records as they need. We're going to ask for where they're getting their money from, what the program name of that money is in, in case it's a state grant program or a federal grant program. Of course, how much they received and how much they dispersed. If it's a federal grant, the CFDA number, and of course, the source of federal funds. If you will notice here, they have an additional source of federal funds or government funds, direct federal grants. Of course, they wouldn't get that from you. That's why it's extra for them. And once they get an E1 filed and we look it over, we have some choices. We can tell them an audit is required. We can give them a tentative waiver when they give us additional information. <laughs> or we can reclassify amounts if they've gotten it wrong. And we do that. We see that every so often. Because we want them to get an audit only when needed. If they filled out something incorrectly, <coughs> excuse me. We don't want them to pay for an audit that's not needed. Uh, we request that all documentation be uploaded into Gateway. We don't want paper. And um, if these entities have gotten a waiver in the past, if they were to upload the same information they did before, Ashley and I or whoever else is looking at this can look at it once and say done. We would like them to do that right off the bat rather than looking at it, asking for more information, having them upload it, look at it again. You all understand whenever we're doing anything, if we touch it once, it's uh, less time. That's all I have. Any questions for me? No? Well, yes. Yes, we have gotten lots of uh, questions as a result of our other. Thank you. Just a minute. I'm gotten a little parched here. I didn't really expect to do so much talking. The other uh, presentations we've given, we've gotten lots of interesting questions, things we didn't even think of. Well, thank you. Well, let me make a comment. I, I think it's kind of hard for libraries to somehow to see how this applies to them sometimes. Mm -hmm. But uh, I know that I've seen an occasion where uh, 
in a, uh, a county it does apply, like when they allocate money to the Boys and Girls Club right. uh, from, say, casino money or something like that. So, But I know that more public libraries are entering into partnerships and there might be some money moving. So hopefully you'll ask those questions of the State Board of Counts. Yeah, the only example I could think of, and this is only a theoretical example, if a local literacy group was promoting, you know, um, um, children's programs and they needed you to get the grant and you got a federal grant, you passed it on to them and they turned around and bought books, that would be assistance to them that you would need to report here. But that's just an example. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. All right, Todd Caldwell back with you. Um, thank you to Linda and Ashley for their information. Um, as I looked at the, the calendar today, you know, we're into November already, and um, it hardly seems possible that um, this year is almost over. And as we get closer to the end of the year, there are some duties that library bookkeepers and treasurers and and such have to do so we thought this would be a perfect opportunity to go over some of those especially if you're new in the position during 2016 or maybe you did some of these things in the very beginning if you started at the first of the year um, and you were probably overwhelmed with stuff so maybe you don't recall um, some of these things that you're going to be doing toward the end of the year so just a little refresher course of some of the things that we're going to talk about and the first one, let me see, I'm not getting it. To... Let's choose the top one. This one? Well, I guess you chose that one. Go ahead and say resume slideshow. And why is it not doing that? So then let's just click on that slide down there, see if we get the same reaction. Yeah, we get the same reaction. Let me open your presentation again. Okay. A little technical difficulty, sorry there. It's uh, Karen's uh, <laughs> solution to everything. Yeah, I went in doubt, shut down, and open it again. Oh. I have to do that with my phone all the time. Okay, let's just uh, open yours up again. And then, do we see it here? It's on E. E? Yeah. It's on E? Okay, let me go ahead. And let's see if we can get back to it. And now we can go to your slideshow the way you view it. Is that okay? Or do you want not to see Are they seeing that? I don't They are seeing that. Okay. We can do the other. You want to do the other. If that's so okay. So we just go over here with the display settings. And we're going to duplicate the slideshow so they see the slideshow. There we go. Okay. Sorry about that. I hope everyone can see the, the screen. If you're not seeing it for some reason, let, let us know. Mm -hmm. um, some of the things that we're going to talk about related to year-end duties are uh, the cancellation of old outstanding checks, uh, any appropriations that you have that you want to encumber into next year, or if you have appropriations that you need to transfer before the end of the year because you, maybe you've overspent a line item, and also um, names and addresses, the list of names and addresses that you report to the county treasurer. I may have uh, may have opened the wrong presentation, so you're going to see some references to cities and towns here because we gave a similar uh, presentation to cities and towns. So um, I'll try to point out things that don't apply to library. So I apologize for that. <laughs> uh, the first two things do uh, we're going to talk about internal control refreshers uh, for year end and uh, talk about materiality thresholds. Now, related to the cancellation of, of warrants, 
Uh, all warrants are checks drawn upo upon public funds of a political subdivision that are outstanding and unpaid for a period of two or more years as of the last day of December of that year are considered void. So a check written in February of 2014, for example, that still hasn't cleared the bank uh, by the end of 2016 uh, by statute is void and can be canceled. Whereas a check that's written in November of 2015 and still outstanding at the end of the year would still be outstanding. So you consider you would still carry that. I do know um, I didn't think banks were taking checks that were that old, but I, I had a call uh, Monday that a bank cashed a check uh, that was written in 2012, and, and the unit that had written the check had done this. They had canceled it, voided it, written it back into their system, and called the bank, and, and the bank claimed that uh, there are some federal regulations that they have to, to cash a check that's presented in good faith. Uh, and they wanted to know what our standpoint was. Well, our, stand, our position is the statute says, actually the statute goes on to say that a, a bank shall not make or accept a check that's over two years old. Um, the unit in this case didn't do anything wrong. I mean, they did what they were supposed to do. So we just said, since it came out of their bank account, and she noticed it when it was on their bank statement, that they just make the, the, an entry in this year's records. They're going to have to show that as a, an expense during this year. So. You know, it could affect appropriations if it was a huge check, but usually huge checks don't, you know, go uncashed for a, a long period of time. But uh, just wanted to make that known to you in case you do happen to see that. Somebody asked unit. if the, oh, I'm sorry, That's if okay. the check is written in November 2014, would that be considered two years? Yeah, it's two years from the the end of the year in which it was written. So. If it was written in November of 2014, then at December 31st of this year, you would, it would, that would be your two years, and then you could go before March 1st, as we're going to talk about on this slide that you see, um, is the deadline really for doing that. Yeah, question in the room? Uh, the question in the room was if it included payroll checks and. and we don't see any stipulation or difference for payroll checks, so so yes, it, it could be a payroll check that if it's been outstanding that long, um, you would do the same procedure. Uh, if that person is still an employee, you might let them know, um, and try to you know try to reduce some of the work on on your end. But um, yeah, if it is a payroll check and you can't find that person, we would you would follow this procedure. So before March 1st, uh, you'll need to prepare a list of all outstanding checks that are outstanding for two or more years. Uh, basically, as I said, any check that you show outstanding that was written in 2014. And then you would give that list to your board. We'd recommend that be during a, a public meeting. Uh, you as the fiscal officer should also keep a copy for your files. And then you will write a receipt for the voided checks and post them to the, to the fund from which they were originally posted and remove them from your outstanding checklist. And if you do some research and you can't determine uh, what fund they were paid out of originally, document that you attempted uh, to research and find it but weren't able to, and then you could, op you could uh, post it as a receipt to your operating fund. Appropriations, as you know, lapse at the end of each year, so any amounts unspent do not carry forward to 2017 unless you encumber the appropriation. To encumber the appropriation, you've got to have an approved purchase order or contract. So the unpaid amount of the purchase order or contract then gets encumbered and carried forward and added to your 2017 budget. So you'll show the encumbered amount separately on your 2017 appropriation ledger, and it will be added to the budget for the same purpose, meaning if you have um, unpaid purchase order for supplies, then you'll add the encumbrance to supplies in next year's budget as opposed to um, some other line item that you might have. Since the unpaid part of the purchase order or contract from 2016 will be dispersed in 2017, it's going to affect your 2017 appropriations if you don't encumber it. The encumbrance makes it so that your 2017 budget doesn't have to pay for any lingering payments from the year before. 
And so we've always suggested that you make a listing of the unpaid portions of purchase orders or contracts and make it part of the minutes of the last meeting of the year. Uh, the board, your board should, during that meeting, make a motion to approve the encumbrances. And I know in some instances, the true amount of the encumbrance might not be known at that December meeting, particularly if you have it in the beginning of the month, like if you had it on December the 10th, you might have you know, some things uh, hanging around after the 10th that you wouldn't know in order for it to be approved at that final meeting. So we've not taken exception if you have to wait until the first meeting in January or your meeting in January, if it's early in the month, to have them approve your encumbrances for that year. What we don't want to see is uh, when you wait until February or, you know, I've seen sometimes as late as April, oh, we were going to encumber that appropriation. Well, you probably should have known before April if you were going to carry that over. So try to keep that in mind. Uh, toward the end of the year, you might find you have some line item appropriations that are going to be overspent or in the negative, and you, um, you don't take additional actions to, to correct those things. So Indiana Code 6-1.1-18-6 provides authority to transfer appropriations from one line item to another within a major budget classification. So you can make such a transfer if you, A, determine a transfer is necessary. The transfer does not require the expenditure of more than the total amount set out in the budget. So it's not like, you, you know, that's saying you can't increase your budget. The transfer is made at a re regular public meeting by resolution, and the transfer can be made without notice. It doesn't require DLGF's approval. Another end of the year duty we'd like to remind you about is the providing of the list of employees uh, who have money due them from your library. Um, and that list goes to the county treasurer. In the end of code 6-1.1-22-14 requires that on or before June 1st and December 1st, you shall certify the names and addresses of each person who has money due the person to the county treasurer. So normally these are your employees, uh, your normal payroll that have money due to them. Uh, it could include, you know, some vendors. But normally it's just the people that are on your, your payroll that you're providing. The county treasurer takes that list and makes sure that those listed are not delinquent in the payment of property taxes. If the treasurer finds that a person on the list is delinquent, the treasurer shall certify the name and amount of tax owed to you as the fiscal officer. And then you shall make periodic deductions from the money due the person and remit them to the treasurer. And a reminder, this statute is a, is a shall statute, so it's our position that you really don't have a choice. You have to make the periodic deductions uh, so that the county gets the taxes on the property paid. And then a couple of other reminders as we approach year end uh, that aren't on the slide. Uh, we get a lot of questions about Christmas parties and year end bonuses. Um, if your library is considering a, a Christmas party, uh, our recommendation is you have maybe the friends operate that, and that way it keeps it off of, you know, your books as as using public funds for you know a holiday party or anything like that. And then year-end bonuses, we don't take exception to those as long as you amend your salary schedule that should be in a resolution form for the year, and your board can go back and amend that to include it. You still have to include all compensation paid and a bonus would be considered compensation. So if they go back and, and want to give everybody a, a bonus at the end of the year, just amend that salary schedule. And there's some parts that don't belong. Uh, our internal control refresher. Um, we've talked about this before, and I, I know we're, it's a, a good topic that we're still getting questions on. So we wanted to kind of give a little refresher and remind everyone of what some of the things are that we're going to expect to see done by the end of the year and, and going into early next year. First, your board should adopt the minimum internal control standards as we've talked about in the past. And you can find on our website and in our standards on internal controls publication. Indiana Code 511-127-G states that the legislative body of your political subdivision shall ensure that internal control standards developed by the State Board of Accounts are adopted 
and that personnel of your entity have received training on those standards. This simply can be a formal adoption of our publication on internal controls. For compliance with the statute, all that is required is the adoption of the internal control standards developed in our publication. As far as the training goes, there's a, about a half an hour webinar uh, for your personnel as defined. By statute, can watch that suffices. That's the minimum training to be provided. So if you wanted to find another webinar in addition to the one that, that we provide, that's fine, but ours is the, is the base minimum. And then again, it's on our website on the internal control page is where you'll find that. Yeah, yeah question in the room? That does include the board members as well, do you mean this? Uh, the question was if that includes board members or not. And we're going to talk about the, the definition of personnel on the next slide. And we, we're kind of leaving that up as far as boards go. If, if you feel they meet that definition, um, then they would be required to take that training. If you don't feel that, we're not going to take exception to that, but we would say, you know, it's 25 minutes out of everybody's life, and it wouldn't hurt to train everybody or as many people as possible. We're not going to write you up for training people that didn't meet the definition, obviously. So, and there's that definition of, of personnel in 511.127c. It's an employee or officer whose official duties include receiving, processing, depositing, dispersing, or otherwise having access to funds that belong to the political subdivision. Now, this next part deals with uh, fiscal officers. Indiana Code 511-127H states that after June 30th of 2016, the fiscal officers shall certify in writing that the minimum internal control standards and procedures have been adopted and that personnel who aren't otherwise on leave have received the training. And that certification made by the fiscal officer shall be filed with the Board of Accounts at the same time as the annual financial report is submitted. So like Linda spoke about earlier, when you're doing your annual financial report in a few months, the fiscal officer is going to have to certify in Gateway that the standards were adopted and the training was provided. So we've taken the audit position that if you haven't adopted the standards and or provided the training yet, you've got until the end of this year to do so. You know, the statute says that things have to be done after June 30th of 2016. That's not by June 30th of 2016, as some people thought. And we chose the end of the year because when you're uh, making those certifications in Gateway, uh, these things have to be done in order for you to certify that they'd be done. So you can't make that certification in your annual report if you haven't done them yet. So that's why we've recommended basically the end of the year. And then when you get into January and you're doing your annual report, you can make those certifications. I do have a question. Could you go over the fiscal officer? For small libraries, the treasurer is not necessarily submitting the reports. I'm not sure what report she's referring to. Uh, in, in some small libraries, if the, the fiscal officer isn't submitting the reports, uh, really it should be the treasurer who has submission rights in Gateway. Um, I know sometimes that treasurer might have, you know, the bookkeeper doing that, and so the the treasurer might give the bookkeeper that information, their username, and, and log in. Um, but it should be the, the fiscal officer, the treasurer, who is submitting that. Now, whether someone else is submitting it for them is, is another thing. Um, but it would be the fiscal officer is the one that the statute talks about making certifications and doing those things in Gateway. So right now, um, I'm going to turn it over to Susan, and she's going to discuss um, a recent case study. I know we've given some case studies in the past, and, and we've heard those kind of help illustrate some of the things that we're talking about and where uh, controls can go wrong, or things can go wrong if the controls are inadequate. And then uh, I'll leave this uh, image up here for you to look at of the five components that we'll talk about after Susan's done. Before I let you go, sure. uh, again about that fiscal officer being the treasurer that the uh, person responded, only the director has thus far had access. Is this something that needs to be put into policy? 
Yeah, I would recommend it, it be in policy that it, that it be the treasurer and um, the person that asked that question. I would recommend that they email the Gateway Help Desk with the Board of Accounts to double check on the the person that has the submission rights in Gateway. And that email address, if they need to, was what Linda provided, but it's basically gateway at sboa.in.gov. So it's gateway at, at sboa.gov. Yeah, gateway at sboa.in.gov. Oh, I forgot the IN. Okay. Okay. Here's Susan. Hi, everybody. Todd and I have gotten a lot of phone calls over the last several months about internal controls, so we know that everybody's working on it, and we appreciate that so much and uh, recognize that you're all doing a good job out there. Uh, one thing I wanted to do was, uh, or we wanted to do, was just to provide a case study just to kind of keep it, keep the information before you that things do go wrong in governmental units when internal controls are not present. and that is why it is so important to have these policies in place. Um, I do have just one report here, but um, and I, I thought it was interesting because the particular person involved here thought of many ways to take money from the governmental unit. So I thought we would just kind of go over those, and uh, you can kind of think of your own situations and um, see if, if there's any controls that you might think of that you could put in place if you don't already have them uh, that might solve some of these issues. Uh, but the first thing that happened was, uh, once again, it's the credit card issue. You know, I think we talk about that about every time we all get together. And um, the main problem there, of course, is making payments on the credit card statement rather and not having any backup documentation to support those charges uh, on the statement. And that was what happened here as well. They were making payments based on the bill, and there was nothing to back up. You know, for example, the purchase at Walmart or, or other, other stores. So this person was able to uh, pay a lot of uh, recreational vehicle camping fees. Uh, she bought a lot of shoes, uh, had her nails done, um, bought a lot of uh, personal food and clothing um, and other expenses like that. It's not nearly as interesting as the wedding ring I had last time, but... Um, nonetheless, nonetheless, it was expenses that probably would have been obvious had uh, backup documentation been been noted. And that was about $30,000, so it really wasn't a small sum of money that was uh, run through that credit card account. There was also an occasion where uh, this person decided to, to venture out from the credit cards and go ahead and just write checks to a particular vendor. Um, there were several vendors involved, but probably the most interesting one here was to Lowe's uh, Home Improvement Store. She decided that she might like to remodel her kitchen, so she bought a refrigerator and freezer and I guess the laundry room too, dishwasher washer and dryer and so forth, um, several thousand dollars worth of appliances. Um, that was found out, and the state police showed up at her house and pulled all of that out of her kitchen and laundry room and gave it back to the unit. Um, the next the next way that she decided she might want to take some money from the unit was she just changed her salary base uh, from thirty six thousand to forty thousand just a, a small amount but still she was able to make that change in her compensation which just increased her salary uh, a little bit more every every pay period she also fiddled around with the insurance uh, deductions at this particular unit the employees paid a hundred percent of their premium through payroll deduction and then that was transmitted to the insurance company but in her case uh, there was no money deducted from her check the the uh, unit just paid for that directly for her also she was allowed to or able to uh, make additional payments uh, under the terms of the health savings account, except she didn't really put them in her health savings account. She put it directly into her personal account. But it looked like it was going to a health savings account. So those were some ways. Other things that happened at this particular unit, there was a sale of some unwanted things. It was In this case, it was scrap material. 
and things were at this particular unit it was not uncommon to sell uh, scrap material and a lot of the money did come back to the unit but in many cases the checks from the purchaser were made payable to the unit and this person was able to just rubber stamp the endorsement and go ahead and then sign it herself and deposit it into her own personal account so again just um, ways to kind of keep track of what kind of sales are going on and what kind of transactions are happening um, another way was through the petty cash fund uh, she just kept asking for reimbursements or replenishment of the petty cash fund with no no receipts or disperse no no documentation to show for that there was also uh, the occurrence of penalties interest and other charges and um, you know these were on on items that are paid regularly and monthly uh, taxes uh, credit card statements and really just a caution to make sure that things are things that are recurring that are paid every month are getting paid every month and not just um, you know maybe you could notice uh, well I didn't make the the tax payment this month I wonder where that is we need to find that out so that you know we don't incur any penalties or interest on that so that was that audit report I just wanted to kind of share that with you to let you know that uh, you know there, there are issues out there and internal controls is is very important and uh, there is a reason that it's that it's being emphasized so much so thank you for your time on that and I'll, I'll turn it back over to Todd Uh, there was quite a bit of discussion about this, uh, whether the treasurer or uh, or the director is inputting this information in there for the annual financial report. And, it, and the, it does say in the code that the attestation is the fiscal officer. So I assume that means a board member. It means that, I believe for a library, it means the treasurer, whoever's signing the check, okay. is well, the fiscal are, officer. Some are saying they're absent. And, and, and not doing this and that that could be like I said if they're inputting it under the the username and the password of the treasurer but it's, it's our understanding that the fiscal officer is the one who should have the submission rights in gateway so if if you're the bookkeeper and not the treasurer and you have submission rights or the right to submit your information in, in gateway then we probably ought to change that to the, the treasurer okay okay Then the, the statute on internal control mentions specifically the five components uh, that are recognized as basic to any system. And you've probably heard us talk about that a lot in the past. They are the control environment, the risk assessment, the control activities, information and communication, and monitoring. And if any of those five are missing, then true internal control isn't achieved. And this graphic that, that you see uh, shows how each are dependent on each other. If you were to to remove or pull out one level of the cube, uh, the rest of those areas aren't going to be able to stand and, and it'll collapse. So each component unit is discussed in our internal control publication, so we're not going to go over um, them in great detail, but I briefly wanted to discuss each. Uh, the control environment uh, comprises the integrity and ethical values of each political subdivision established by the oversight body and management. So it's kind of the control at the top and, and how you're going to govern and control your the activities of your library. Uh, risk assessment is the process used to identify and assess internal and external risks to the achievements of objectives and then establish risk tolerances. Control activities are the actions and tools established through policies and procedures that help detect, prevent, or reduce the identified risks that interfere with the achievement of your objectives. Some examples are your bank reconciliations, authorizations, the approval processes that you might have, performance reviews, and verification processes that you might have. Separating the ability to record, authorize, and approve the transactions along with the handling of the related asset reduces the risk of error or fraudulent actions. In small libraries, I know that such segregation might not always be practical. In those cases, we've recommended that some compensating activity uh, be 
implemented, um, which can do to include additional levels of review for key operational processes, uh, random and or periodic review of selected transactions, for example. Information and communication, uh, that's relevant and quality information for, from both internal and external sources is necessary to support the functioning of the other components of internal control. And monitoring activities are just that, the monitoring of controls to ensure that procedures and controls are being followed by officials and employees. This one is usually the weakest we see during our audit and the one that's lacking uh, most often when fraud occurs. So that was a brief uh, refresher on internal controls and what you have to do by the end of the year and some examples of what can go wrong and if internal controls are lacking. Uh, next we're going to go over another part of Indiana Code 511.127 regarding setting a materiality threshold uh, for reporting variances or losses to the State Board of Accounts. This part of the statute is in letter J of 511.127. It requires notification to the Board of Accounts for any erroneous or irregular material variances, losses, shortages, or thefts by outside sources of funds slash cash or property. The statute goes on to list what we will do with that, including determining the amount involved, determining the internal control weakness that led to the variance, making rec written recommendations for corrections, and noting the internal control policies or procedures that need modification. So this is another one of those slides that refers to a town, so you insert library where you see town. <laughs> uh, each board will need to set a dollar amount over which a vari variances or losses will be reported. So that's going to vary from library to library. Um, a $500 variance at a small library might be material whereas a $500 variance at a larger library might not be material. Or a $500 variance that occurs every Friday might be something that even if it's not material, it gets you thinking, why is this happening every Friday? And you might need to report that to us. So some instances uh, covered by this include like your bank reconcilement is materially off, a break-in occurs, and a, or a, and a vehicle is stolen or a material error occurs that results in reporting irregularities. So these would be items that exceed your materiality threshold. Remember, if you don't set one, uh, we consider your threshold to be zero. So any variances that, that we find, or if we come in to do the audit that you haven't reported to us, you'd be not in noncompliance with the statute and we'd probably take a written audit exception in your report have a couple of examples to go over. I, I got an email Monday uh, from a city that in their utility department their cash drawer was $100 short at the end of the day and they had not yet passed um, a threshold. It was on the agenda for the upcoming meeting. I think that's tomorrow. But as of the time of that that loss they didn't have one so she was calling to report that they were $100 short because their threshold she knew was zero because they hadn't set one yet. Another example of a, a variance that got reported to us last week um, is, is much more important. So if you don't remember anything else that we've talked about today, remember this scenario and it involves another email scam. I think we notified everybody earlier in the year that there were a couple of places that had been victimized by an email scam and, and it's happened again. Um, a unit got an email from a, a person of a, what appeared to be from a person of authority within that organization to the fiscal officer and it required or requested a transfer of $31,000 by the end of the day to to a, a place and, and they provided the routing number and the account number and the fiscal officer when it knew that the um, person of authority, the department head, was on vacation so they, they processed it. They went ahead and, and wired that money by the end of the day. Didn't ask any questions or anything, just wired it. Um, it was toward the end of the week, so um, knowing that the person on the other end of the transaction got some money, I uh, knew they, they had a, a, g a good prospect to get some more at the beginning of the next week, sent another email, two more emails, 
uh, requesting two more wire transfers. Again, uh, it appeared it was from the department head of this place, and this time the fiscal officer was on vacation, so the deputy that was checking the fiscal officer's email saw it and knew that they had processed a transfer the week before, so they processed these next two transactions. Um, they went to a bank in Florida, and luckily someone at the bank noticed that these were occurring and notified the, the unit that it was coming from that these might be fraudulent emails and that they should do some investigation. So, of course, that was the point at which they tried to contact the department head, and they found out, no, these emails were not legitimate. Their email account had been hacked and sent to this place. So they contacted the bank and said, don't release you know, these funds. And the, and the bank said that the person on their end, it was Bank in Florida, if I didn't mention that before, um, said that the customer had been contacting them to see when the funds were available and had contacted them several times. So um, the bank was going to tell them that the funds had finally come through and then being released by the bank when, in fact, they, weren't, they didn't have an intent on releasing it so when the customer came in she was met by the local police and confessed to um, being blackmailed that uh, she was a 73 year old woman and was being blackmailed and so she was sending these emails out the first transaction she had received the money from the the week before she had went right around and emailed it to a bank in Florida so it was some kind of money laundering scheme where we were wiring this money all over the place, and, and she had all the paperwork and, and was providing that to the police, and they're now you know, investigating that in Florida, and, and the local authorities are investigating it because it included wire transfers and such. I'm sure that you know, some federal authorities will be looking at it as well. Um, the bottom line is if you get any emails requesting you to transfer funds, and even if it looks like it's from somebody within your organization, you know, question it, do your due diligence and find out, you know, more about it. Don't just take the email's word for it because the their account's probably been hacked, especially if it's somebody on vacation. You know, the, the three instances I know of, it seemed like somebody was either off sick or on vacation. So I don't know if that's just circ um, circumstantial type of things, the coincidence that these hackers or sending this stuff out, and, and or if when they hack the account, if they see that you know John Doe's going to be on vacation or John Doe's been out sick, so I'll send these emails and see if if somebody uh, bites on it. But people are still falling victim to this, so as long as that continues, we'll, you'll probably hear us say, "Don't you know wire money without asking some questions." You know, if if you have to get up and go down the hall, if that person's in your building that you think emailed it, go ask them, "Hey, did this really come from you?" Um, if you have, if they're on vacation or they're off sick, you know, call them. Don't don't do it without finding out some more about it. I can't think of an instance where somebody would would think it was okay to wire money if they hadn't already, especially tens of thousands of dollars, if they hadn't already known that there was a contract or some vendor had really done some work. I mean, as the fiscal officer, I would think you would be in the know enough to to question something if. You saw it, that you, it was the first you were hearing of it. Um, so just be aware of that. That's, you know, to kind of piggyback off what Susan mentioned in her case studies. And, and it's just a lack of monitoring and a lack of following your internal control. You know, you all know that things are supposed to go through the process and get approved by the board before you write any, any checks or make any payments. And, and then we just circumvented the controls at this unit here without um, doing anything to to tie that down anymore, and as a result, right now they're out $59,000. So um, they hope they're going to be able to recoup some of that, but I doubt it. So Indiana Code 511-127L is somewhat similar to the provisions for the loss that we just discussed on the previous screen. Uh, in 27L, we're referring to a public officer who has knowledge of or a reasonable cause to believe there's been a misappropriation of public funds or assets or basically a theft by another public official. So it's not a theft by a member of the public. That would fall under uh, subsection J. Um, in L, we're talking about theft or misappropriation by a public official. 
and the theft or misappropriation is to be immediately reported in writing, which means a letter or email uh, to State Board of Accounts and the county prosecutor. And when it comes to theft by a public official, remember there is, um, there is no materiality, so the level is zero. All such instances are to be reported to the Board of Accounts. So even if you have actual knowledge or reasonable cause to believe that even a dollar has been misappropriated, you're required to immediately report it to us and the local prosecutor. That way we can get involved in, you know, maybe you knew someone stole a small amount, maybe it was a just one-time thing, or if they confronted, you know, they'll, they'll say, well, I meant to borrow it and I'm going to pay it back, but maybe that practice has been going on for years, and, and that's why um, we need to know so that we can get in and take a look. The state examiner issued uh, Directive 2015-6 related to materiality thresholds and reporting misappropriations. And it can be viewed on our website under directives or at the link that should be in your information that you were able to see. And it came out last April. And a clarifying memo was also issued last April re reiterating that there is no materiality threshold when we're talking about thefts uh, by public officials. So that was, that concludes what um, we wanted to present. Are there any questions that uh, in the room or anything? Well, there was one more question in regard to that treasurer. And uh, does this include all reports, the annual financial report, the 100R, or what they are submitting? And that goes to re reference the, you know, in the gateway who submits. Right. We're, yeah, it, it includes both the 100R and the annual financial report submitted in gateway. Well, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Todd. That was quite a bit, and we're almost done. We just have uh, announcements from the uh, Indiana State Library, and Steve Schmidt's going to come up and make those announcements. Okay, thank you for all your patience today. I know you guys have been sitting and, and learning for a long time, so I'll be brief. But we're now in the happy season for state employees because the month of November is the day we have more holidays than any other month. So I want to remind you that we'll be closed next Tuesday on the 8th, next Friday on the 11th, and then the following Saturday. And then for Thanksgiving, we'll be closed on the 24th and then on the 25th for Lincoln's birthday. Don't ask. Um, the reason I mention this is just to remind you that InfoExpress, the courier system, does not run on dates when the state library is closed. So all in all, there are uh, four or five days this month when you will not be receiving courier service. That is not a breakdown in the system. That is our schedule. Um, Another date of import is on Monday, November 21st, one of the days we will be open. Um, we have two events, one on-site and one off-site. That is the day of the Indianapolis Public Library nonprofit book sale. Over the weekend, they have their public book sale. And then on the following Monday, the doors are thrown open at 8.30 and any a representative from a nonprofit, such as any library in the state, is welcome to come up and load up bags and boxes of the books for free. Now, if you are an InfoExpress subscriber, we will provide you with the bags and we will ship them to your library. If you're not a subscriber, don't load your card up so much that you break your axle. We had that happen one year. Um, that afternoon at 1 o'clock in this building, we'll have our semi-annual interlibrary loan workshop, which will touch on the latest things that are happening with Indiana Share, Info Express, with the new CIRCS system, um, the book clubs and the like. So it's very informative. It's a free workshop from 1 to 3. Registration for both of these events is on the State Library events calendar, so you can sign up for them. 
Um, I mentioned a moment ago uh, CIRCS, the Statewide Remote Circulation System. Hopefully you have heard of it by now. Right now we have 141 libraries participating in the system with a shared catalog of over 30 million items. And since we went live uh, in the middle of August, we've had over uh, just shy 7,000 requests placed in the system. This is a new user-initiated request system. It's a, a new form of interlibrary loan that is much, ideally much faster and easier to use. It is cheaper for libraries to manage, but it's a slightly different way of looking at interlibrary loan than most of us um, are familiar with. I, I mention this because on December 1st, we are opening a 60-day window for more libraries to join in CIRCS. Uh, and you join basically by filing a letter of intent to participate um, during that window. And then we will collect some information from you. And the State Library has agreed to pay all of the connect charges and the um, setup fees for all participating libraries in the state. Now, there are some other add-ons that you may want to use. Those would be at your cost. There are some potential labor costs, because a small library that all of a sudden jumps into the big pool for resource sharing, they're all of a sudden, they're going to get a lot more requests than they used to. So there is some labor cost on your side, but I'll be glad to talk to anybody about that. Matter of fact, that brings me to my last topic. We have the ILF annual conference coming up next week on the 8th, 9th, and 10th. On Wednesday at 1.30, I will be talking about CIRCS, its impact, and um, the results of its first uh, couple of months in operation. And then that morning at 11 o'clock, I'll be talking about um, the new standards that you've heard about today that are go into effect on January uh, 1st, along with um, what the changes are and what kind of uh, impact uh, we expect that you'll see from them. And that is all I have. Well, thank you, Steve. That's all we have for today. And um, you can look for your LEU certificates, uh, hopefully not more than 30 days from today. I'll get those out to you. And um, I'll also have a um, survey to send out to you as well. So thank you for your attendance. And be safe. Bye-bye.